yeah so it's 5 30 uh i i think uh we can start uh michelle shall we start yes yeah of course. whenever um yeah please uh please mm -hmm. proceed so uh hello everyone i'd like to welcome today's speaker dr mb sakib hassan dr hassan is an assistant professor at the university of mississippi since uh, 2019 he received his PhD degree in electrical engineering from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville in 2017. Uh, Dr. Hassan is doing active research on neuromorphic computing, uh, secure nanoelectric circuit design, semiconductor device modeling, and nonlinear dynamics uh, and VLSI circuit design. In today's talk, he will introduce us with the basics of neuromorphic computing and also talk about his own research. Uh, additionally, he will uh, give us some idea about the important challenges and opportunities in this field. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Hassan, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for giving me this wonderful opportunity and uh, arranging this thing. <clears throat> I'm flexible enough to postpone this uh, by one week. So today's talk, of course, I wanted to first introduce uh, the audience to neuromorphic computing. Uh, it is a very hot research topic right now. There is a lot of interest. Uh, it has any, like any computing paradigm, it has a lot of different abstraction layer. So covering everything in details is beyond the scope of a one hour talk. So I will try to give a summary talk, but I am going to come at this from my background. So it might be different from a, someone who is coming from a more computer science or algorithmic background. So given that, uh, so let me start uh, with this thing. We have a lot of slides. So since I have a lot of slides and those slides can contain a lot of you know, information, one thing I would first like to make clear is that what I expect my audience is that I'm not assuming anything. So I'm assuming that it would be a wide ranging audience. So sometimes I can go over something which seems very basic and sometimes it feels like I'm going over things too fast. So the reason uh, I'm organizing the talk this way is that Dr. Mahmoud told me that uh, this will be recorded and this will be uploaded. So the idea of the slides is that I'm not expecting you to follow the slides, uh, all the slides and all the information. You don't actually need to, it might be overwhelming actually. Better, can, you can take it like a podcast. So if you just follow what I'm saying and kind of follow the story, I think then you will get the big picture and that's what I'm getting. Now, the reason I'm putting all this information in the slides is that it will be recorded. And I'll also provide the slides with all the resources. So if you find this topic interesting and any of the subfield you want to explore more detail, then you can go into the slides. And so please try to follow this more as a podcast, follow what I'm saying. And I think that will be good enough. And you know, I think it will be more enjoyable time. Okay, so with that, let me start with the topic. So first I'm going to talk about, okay. if you're studying with neuromorphic computing, I'll talk about computing in general. So the, what kind of computing we are currently doing. So you guys probably, most of you are familiar with this, that computing is a huge thing. It has changed the world in the last uh, 70, 80 years, especially with the great uh, pioneers like von Neumann and Turing. the idea of computation became more rigorous. Uh, with Shannon, the idea of information became more rigorous. And then we had this wonderful jackpot. We hit the jackpot, we did, came up with the transistor, and then start things getting started miniaturized. And now we have almost unbelievable computing power at our hands. Sometimes maybe we take it for granted. This is amazing the way this field has emerged. Uh, I would be as daring to say that it has never happened in the history of human life with any other technology. And I'm not saying that because it's my field. I think this is objectively true and not because electrical and computer engineers or computer scientists are more smarter than other uh, fields of engineering. I think we, we got lucky. Uh, we really got lucky with this, uh, some of these things, but of course there are a great deal of ingeniousness went into this. So I first want uh, the audience to appreciate uh, the, what happened with the computing revolution. Uh, so any computing system, the kind of computing system that we use nowadays, mostly digital, mostly VLSI, von Neumann based system, uh, it's not possible to work with billions of transistors that we have in a single chip. So we use abstraction layers. And this is the kind of figure people use. So at the very low level, uh, if you follow my, um, is my, so if you follow my cursor pointer, uh, at the very low level, there is the device. 
which actually does the computation. So that's the transistor, let's say in our case, MOSFET or CMOS, uh, which is the most common device. Uh, even below that, there is the material. So of most popular is silicon, but of course you can use other materials. So people have to, some people work on this field. They develop the materials and the device and characterize it. On top of that, there is a circuit. So you combine some of these devices to build useful circuit. It can be digital circuit, it can be analog circuit. Uh, in the digital domain, it can be logic circuit or arithmetic circuit. Anyway, so you build useful circuits together and combine them and build bigger level of abstraction. So it can be an AND gate or gate or MARX multiplexer, or it can be an encoder decoder or even bigger circuit like a 32, 64 bit adder, multiplier, so and so forth. And then you combine some lot of these gates together and then you build a module and architecture. And eventually you put everything together in a system on a chip and build a, let's say, a microprocessor, an Intel cells and microprocessor, something like that. So it's not possible for anyone to you know, design at the levels of transistors because we have billions of transistors now. So people find this abstraction level, it's very useful and it makes uh, helps us with the productivity. Okay, given this layer, I should say that I am coming from this from electrical engineering electronics perspective. So my background was in uh, device modeling, VLSI, that kind of thing. And in 2017, I went into a postdoc in the University of Tennessee after I finished PhD. Uh, under Dr. Garrett Rose uh, in 10 lab in UTK. And that's why I got used to, got uh, like introduced to this neuromorphic computing thing, which I found fascinating. So, but before going there, uh, I need to show like why we need neuromorphic computing. So this was great. This conventional computing paradigm was working great. So it all builds up on VLSI. We can build a lot of transistors into this thing. Uh, I am not going to bore you with all the details, but suffice it to say that a single transistor, you can turn it on or off. It can be one or zero, linear logic. Based on that, you can if you can put a lot of them together to make them very tiny, then you have a lot of compute power in your head. So that was the basic, basic idea. The growth rate is phenomenal, as I have mentioned. Uh, this is kind of a plot of annual cell, as you can see, it's going on, has been going on for a long time now. Uh, now a little bit of background in the invention of the transistor, which I think is a great game changer, is 1947 in Bell Labs, uh, three scientists uh, first came up with the a transistor before we used vacuum tube, before then we used even bigger switches. Uh, transistor is the very small thing, it can work as the switch and if you can put a lot of them together, you can build useful circuits. So initially people tried with something called BJT, bipolar transistors, then came MOSFET. There are a lot of challenges with MOSFET. People figured it out. Uh, we had NMOS, PMOS. And then people come up with the idea of complementary MOS, CMOS in 1960s. Turned out that for digital circuit, it's awesome because no static power loss. So it only computes power when it is um, doing any real computation. So input is changing only that uh, dynamic power. No static power. Uh, some of these assumptions are not true anymore. In the last 15 years, things have been breaking down. Our transistors have become more and more leaky, which will actually lead why we need a new computing paradigm. So that's, this is kind of the background. Okay, so this integrator circuit, 1958, uh, people learned how to put a lot of these transistors together. Uh, it was a big thing, another Nobel Prize on this. We have now all these Intel and AMDs and these huge microprocessors with billions of transistors together in the integrator circuit. We are kind of used to IC chips nowadays in every like, facet of our life. Now, I would mention something which probably all of you have heard. It's called Moore's Law. So Moore's Law is not really a law. It's just an observation uh, Intel founder Gordon Moore made in 1965 that he saw that he only had four data points actually, as you can see at the time. And he saw that the number of transistors per chip, the integrated circuit, has been kind of doubling every 18 months so he predicted that this will probably go on he, based on the technology for the next two decades, which was enormous if it actually happens. Nobody expected an exponential growth to grow more than 20 years. In fact, 20 years was a huge extrapolation. For some, and no industry ever does this. For some weird reason, we have been able to keep up with this growth rate for 60 years. And of course, last 10, 15 years, it has been slowing down, which is why we need other computing paradigms. But I just want to emphasize that this has been, I still find it mind bending that this has actually gone on for last. So just to give an example, like the big 
thing in 1971 was the Intel microprocessor, commercial microprocessor. It was a huge thing. Like we have 200, uh, 2300 switches, 2300 switches, transistors in a chip. So nothing, people have not seen nothing like this. Before. It was a huge thing. 2000 chip, so that's the three orders of magnitude. Now we have nine orders of magnitude or billions of tons. So we have increased the number of switches by six order of magnitude from 1971 to now. So let's say 50 years, which is, and I don't have much word for this, like very surprising. I mean, no field has grown like this. Anyway, so sometimes what happens is that when you have a field which is growing so fast, people kind of get used to it. And now it is everybody expect that every two years, everything will be double, you know, this move slow thing. So you'll have more transistors in the chip. So transistor compute cost will be less. You'll have more compute power, more memory and everything. And people kind of expect that every two years this will happen. If that does not happen, people get impatient. But actually the fact that this has been happening for last 56 years, that is the miracle. Not the fact that it has been slowing down in the last 10, 15 years, I think. Uh, so Moore's law has been going great. Uh, so this is showing for 40 years trend. So it's a semi-log plot. So linear in semi-log means that exponential flow. So you are I think, all familiar with this kind of thing. So it was all great. The feature size, which means the minimum uh, length of transistor that you can make, has been going down exponentially as well. So let's say 1970, it was 10 micrometer, which is a huge thing, huge technological innovation in 1970. In fact, micrometer itself is very, very small. Uh, but now our standard has gone so high that uh, now if Intel makes two extra years to make uh, one generation leap, we get impatient and it's difficult to stay in the business. So that's how, uh, how much things have changed. So started at 10 micrometers. So now people are making 10 nanometer. I think TSMC is also making seven nanometer. Google is also, I think, doing it. It's difficult to keep track of all this technology growth because every two, three years they come up with a new thing. But I think we are roughly hovering around 10 nanometer, seven nanometer. The problem is that this has been very difficult, but because uh, Bootslow has a positive feedback kind of thing. So because there is huge investment, people are buying a lot of chips. So uh, there is huge investment. Materials, device scientists, they have been uh, working and always finding a way. So when people hit one micrometer around 1980s, uh, people thought that one micrometer is kind of the limit. How small can you make it? So one micrometer is 1,000 nanometers, right? And we have now uh, 10 nanometers. So one micrometer once seemed impossible. Uh, we went below 100 nanometer, which also seemed impossible, and people predicted this. So there is a funny saying that uh, the people, the number of people that say Moore's law is dead grows exponentially every year, because this thing that predicted that Moore's law is ending, Moore's law is ending, uh, it has been going on for the last 30 years. People are saying, no, it's not possible. You cannot go below 100 nanometer. Uh, you don't have the wavelength. You cannot do the photolithography. Some of uh, engineers have always found a way around this, right? So. And people kind of, I think, got complacent a little bit. They're always there will be creative engineers who find a way around. However, things have become really difficult under 90 micro under 90 and especially under 65, 45 nanometer thing. Uh, first of all, the transistor, our conventional physics of transistor, the way it works, has become uh, like it has become leaky. So the main advantage of CMOS is that the static power loss is almost zero. It's not true anymore. Uh, it works with something called electrostatic control. And for uh, this talk, like it's difficult to control it when the length becomes. So there are some non-ideal effects that become prominent. Also, when you go into that kind of uh, like 10 nanometer, seven nanometers, a lot of quantum effect. Uh, so Debye wavelength, you are getting close to that. A uh, lot of quantum effects become prominent. So tunneling and other non-ideal non effects become uh, bad for your circuit. So, we have been facing a issues, a lot of issues. So nowadays, going from one technology node to another technology node is a huge investment. So the fabrication facilities that we have have shrink and shrink. And now we only have a handful of fabrication facilities who can make this modern day 14 nanometer, 10 nanometer technology. So there is this TSMC, of course, the big giant now. And of course, Intel still makes their own chips. And there is Samsung and Global. I think IBM makes some chips, but very few. Okay, so there is a lot of security and US government, everybody. So they passed the chips act recently. So want to make onshore chips and all that. So there is this huge problem with scaling down. I mean, it is still going on, but it has been slowing down. 
and there is a lot of problems people are facing. It. I personally think, again, I might be proven wrong, but I personally think that this time around, we are actually in a real bind. It's not like the previous era where it was a technological problem. Like how can you make below 100 nanometer? Uh, below five nanometer, making a good transistor using the physics that we are using now for MOSFET or FinFET nowadays, I don't think how it's possible. I, maybe I, again, I from naive perspective maybe, but I don't think, I think this time this is real. I think this time Moore's law is actually an, and we should prepare for it. So the implication of Moore's law is that even if you don't make any changes in the software, in the computation and everything, everything remains the same. Just because transistors are becoming half and half size, you will get double and double of performance. Of course, computer architects are doing the way it works and software engineers and algorithmic work. But even if you don't do anything, just because of Moore's law, computation power has been going down. You know, I don't think we can rely on this for, maybe it will go on for next 10 decades, albeit uh, slower. But I think we, right now, we need to look into alternative way of doing things. So this is how I actually got into this thing. So I, in my PhD life, I was exploring a new transistor, new kind of device. I kind of, I, I was starting feeling that the conventional paradigm is probably slowing down and we need something new. So one way of doing that is neuromorphic computing. So that's kind of the background and I'll go to that. But uh, so there are a few other slides which explain the situation, why this is important as a historical perspective. I'm not going to go into any details on this. But uh, let me go into uh, something of like, uh, like why we need neuromorphic computing, given this background of transistor technology. So I have put some more slides. So if anybody is interested, can I'll upload the slides as well with the videos. So you can look into it. But now, given this background that um, conventional computation paradigm has been slowing down and all that. Uh, so Moore's slow has been slowing down. Uh, people have been looking into alternative techniques. So is it only the fact that Moore's slow is slowing down? Not really. So there are a few other factors that has emerged in the last 20 years. So first of them, I think the most important, so of course I have talked about the plateauing of Moore's law, but the, another important thing is called von Neumann bottleneck. So if you probably all of you are familiar with that the conventional computer, digital computer that we use, it uses an architecture originally developed by John Roman and his colleagues. So it's called the von Neumann architecture. The thing that we need to know for this talk is that in von Neumann architecture, there is a clear divide between memory and computation. So there is a processor which does computation, track, stuff like that, real computation. And there is something where you store the information. So if you as a human being, you need to remember things and then you have to make reasoning and make decisions. So in the human brain, those things are located in the same place. But in digital computer that people developed in the early 40s, the architecture was uh, clearly separated. So memory and processing were separate. Uh, now Moore's law has been going, uh, going up faster and everything. So computation has been fasting, uh, becoming faster and faster, uh, processor and uh, memory both. However, Memory has not been becoming as fast as the computation. The processor has been becoming. So there is a huge bottleneck now. So what, ha what is happening is actually counterintuitive. Most of the time, digital computer currently takes to solve a problem is not really doing the actual computation. It's going back and forth between memory and the processor. So this is called the von Neumann bottleneck. So people have been trying to come around, like how can you solve this? How can you improve the memory? And there has been great work on this, but this is a fundamental problem of the architecture again. It's not about like deep representation. Like the architecture itself is like this. And von Neumann and the early pioneers, like Alan Turing, they are always looking into human brain and trying to inspire. They knew that there is another way of doing this. But we started with this thing. It is simple to understand. And with Moore's law exponentially growing, we have, did not have to worry about these things that much. Starting from 2005, this became really prominent. People starting becoming more uh, noticing this more. Another reason that happened is 2005, uh, 2005, 2006. Uh, we started hitting something called a power. So this is sometimes called the memory one, one even that one. There is another wall that we are hitting, which is called the power one. So this is the third point that I'm saying. So power wall, again, the details is a little bit more subtle, but for this talk's purpose. So what is happening is that when you do the scaling, this more slow thing, making transistors smaller and smaller, there is something called Dennard scaling. So it's pioneered by Dennard. Um, so it means that, yes, transistor becomes smaller, so you can pack more of them in, into the same area, 
but also they become faster because the electron has to travel less. And also the power of this thing also goes down. So the overall power density remains the same. So the heat does not become too hot. So this is, again, that's why I'm saying that I think we hit a jackpot in this technology because usually it never happens. If you make a change, there are usually trade-offs. One thing goes down, another thing goes up. This is a, one of those cases in Moore's law where transistor becomes scale is smaller. You increase the density of the computation. You also improve the speed. And you also, so like everything is just positive and positive. If you can make the transistor small. So right now, around 2000, what problem we had is that when you go with 100 nanometer, it's very difficult to scale everything down. You can make the transistor smaller. That does not mean you can reduce the threshold voltage in the same scale. So threshold voltage, you can think of that transistor is a switch. You have to apply a certain voltage to turn it on or below that it's off. So that's, let's say, threshold voltage. What we expect is that everything will go down equally. It does not happen. So after 2000, this problem became really serious because there are some inherent limits. Again, this is not a technology limit. This is the limit of the fundamental physics. Uh, our MOSFET physics, the way it works, it is restricted by a fundamental physical law, which is called the Boltzmann limit. So in this particular physics, uh, the sub-threshold swing, so when you make the transistor off, you go below threshold, uh, the minimum you can achieve is 60 millivolt per dec decade, which means that if you want to reduce the current by a decade, which means 10 times, you have to reduce the voltage by 60 millivolt. At least no real transistor achieves this ideal thing. It's the best one, maybe 90, 100, something like that. You can do some double gate thing to improve this. But you know, let's say the best possible, case, 60 millivolt per decade. To distinguish a good one and zero, at the noise immunity, which was the huge thing why digital won over analog. You need to have a good distinction between ones and zero. So you need to have a, let's say, five times difference. So 60 millivolt times five is 300 millivolt. So you need at least to have this 300 millivolt gap. And if you stack more transistors, you need even more power supply. Long story short, what people found out after 2000 is that VDD, the power supply of the chip, is not scaling down the way transistor is scaling down. Why this is so important? Because as it turns out that the energy, you all know, is uh, half CV squared, the capacitor energy. So the supply voltage energy to do some computation will be CV squared. And uh, then you, know, you can go into power by multiplying with frequency. But the main story is that the energy is compared, uh, proportional to V squared, not V. So if V does not go down in the same speed, energy actually does not go down in V squared. So energy becomes, the power becomes uh, significantly more than it can contain in that chip. So if you actually keep the scaling and put, let's say two times more transistor, power should remain roughly the same, it doesn't. Uh, power density doesn't, power density keep increasing. So around 2006, the chips started became so hot that it was not feasible anymore. So before that, what people used to do, you probably remember this, I remember this from my early childhood, that whenever the computer, they came up with a new computer, they always promoted with the clock frequency. Uh, before it was one gigahertz, now it's two gigahertz and so forth. And on 2005, things started changing. Clock frequency kind of became saturated because if you increase the clock frequency even further, the energy will be too much to control. You know, power, it, we hit the power. People, I mean, Intel actually had a very difficult time with that uh, chip, I forgot the name around that time. So, there was a sea change in the computation world at that time. People found out that this whole clock frequency increasing with a single CPU is not sustainable. We can't do this anymore. Even if Moore's law continues, which it is not. But I mean, even if it continues, because of this power wall, we could not increase that. So people came up with a different architecture, uh, like multi-core multi, multi -core, uh, CPUs. And from that, it has become the norm. So two core, now four core, eight cores. Now we had huge number of server cores. So parallel computing is kind of a circumvent this problem. Okay, so these are, I, I would say, that the three main problems that facing the conventional computing. So people are becoming worried because a lot of this is, has to do with fundamental physics. So how can we get around this? Now, one simple solution is there. Like, what if we come up with a new transistor, a new switch, which does not have any of this problem, uh, does not have Boltzmann limit, you know, does not have the power scaling problem. Yeah, I mean, that will solve all our problems. So the next, they some research lab comes up with a new transistor, which is a new physics, 
And people have been promising this thing for last 15 years. Most of them have not been realized yet. So for example, there have been some exciting work in negative capacitance transistor, which theoretically can go beyond the Boltzmann limit. So there are very exciting work on this field. Uh, maybe some of them will become fruitful, we'll see. But so that's very like device level. If you come with a new device, new switch, similarly from vacuum tube to transistor, maybe we'll go from transistor to a new device and that will change everything, possibly. So some people are exploring. That. Other people are going from, instead of going bottom up, going from top down. That maybe the way we are doing the computation, we need to rethink our von Neumann architecture. Maybe there is a different way of doing computation. And this is where they came up with the idea of neuromorphic computing or brain-inspired computing. Of course, you guys probably have heard about quantum computing and other paradigms. Those are also very exciting things and people are exploring that. But the natural thing to ask is that, is the digital computer, the way it is computing, is the only way to do computation? Obviously not, because we human beings or other mammals, we have a particular brain, we process information and do useful things. I mean, some more than others maybe, but like, but somehow we are doing this and uh, we are consuming very low energy. So yes, maybe we are not as precise or as fast as digital computers, but we are very good at certain tasks. And computers are very good at certain, like digital computers are very good at certain tasks. So maybe for some of these tasks like natural language processing or image processing, where evolution over millions of years have prepared out these organisms, this brain, to solve this problem very efficiently, very low energy cost. Maybe we can learn something from that and build a modern day computer, which is a very different architecture. It's not like a von Neumann architecture where memory and uh, processing is separate. It's more like brain, uh, organism's brain, where things are co-located. It, it consumes very low energy, has a very different algorithm and architecture of computation. And maybe then we can come up with new devices which will enable this new technology. So it's more from a top-down uh, approach to this. But I mean, to do this, I want to emphasize one uh, figure that I just mentioned before, that to do this, again, we are ex like trying to do something very ambitious. We are coming up with a new computation paradigm. And it will have similar abstraction layer like this one, like the conventional layer. So, some people will work on the device, materials and device. Some will work on circuit, some will work on architecture, some with algorithm and you know, application software, which is not shown. Same thing with neuromorphic computing. So it's not possible for me to cover all of them in any detail. And I'm not qualified actually to talk about all of these things. I work on a certain particular uh, level of this aspect, but I will try to cover at least everything to pique your interest so that you can explore which subfield you are interested in. Anyway. So this is the main interest, brain-inspired computing, but there are some other interests. So something very interesting happened around 2010, uh, I think all of us are familiar with, is that this artificial intelligence boom, uh, artificial intelligence has been happening for a long time. People have been exploring from many bodies. Uh, neural network is also not new. Uh, the main algorithms, even the back propagation, 80s, 90s, people knew this. It was not the most popular one because we did not have enough data and it did not have enough computation power brings back us to Moore's law. Actually, what happened is that because of Moore's law, exponential increase of compute power and the availability of data, in 2000, the famous AlexNet paper, George Hinton's group, they showed this uh, deep neural network, best performance compared to the conventional machine learning algorithm. So neural network became the rage and still is a huge thing, chat GPT nowadays, everybody's talking about this. Thing. So the so neural network is of course, people talk about, again, neural network is a, Brain inspired computation. And some people, when people talk about neuromorphic computation, some people also include conventional neural networks, like deep neural network or convolutional neural network. I will beg to differ a little bit, but this is a good application. So, so there are many people who would actually include this as part of neuromorphic computing as well. So efficient implementation of neural network, because neural network is by nature parallel. Uh, so if you want to implement that in our sequential computer, it takes a lot of energy. It is also not very efficient. And that's why actually they had to wait until 2010 when GPUs are available and they had these people who can almost magically program these GPUs to do this thing. So the conventional computing paradigm, the way we learn programming is a sequential thing. It's not really suitable for neural network kind of thing. More brain-like thing, because it is originally inspired from brain, 
so if we can make something inherently parallel, the computing architecture, which is inherently parallel, and where things uh, memory and computation is co-located, maybe we can do efficient implementation of neural network. And people have been exploring new devices that would enable this. I'll mention a few of them. And of course, the convergence of efficient offline and online learning in this new world of IoT and big data. So in IoT, I'm mentioning because billions of devices are now connected together. Intelligence, we want intelligence on these devices, but we are very power limited in IoT, uh, battery power limited. So we don't want them to run for too long. So we want to make them as energy efficient as possible. As I am mentioning that conventional computing consumes a lot of energy. Our brain consumes a lot less energy. So you probably have heard that AlphaGo, uh, so there is this machine learning thing, defeated the winner of AlphaGo. Yeah, that's one way of looking at it, yes. But if you look at how much energy that world champion in Go is consuming while he's doing things, and what is the machine learning algorithm is consuming, what he's doing, it's orders and orders of magnitude different. So the question is computation, but at what, what cost? We oftentimes, when people in the computational world were so focused on accuracy and uh, performance and speed, they ignore, they used to ignore the energy aspect of it. But I, at this stage, uh, I don't think it is, we can ignore this anymore. So that's another inspiration for neuromorphic computing, which promises that uh, similar to human brain or mammalian brain, we can call, uh, compute efficient with less energy. Okay. So that's kind of the motivation behind neuromorphic computing. So there is a big picture, very rough picture here. Uh, let me go ahead. Uh, so for the resources, so in this talk, I am like, again, all the stacks in the computation layer, I cannot cover. So I am following a summary review paper. So this is from Koshik Rai, Akhilesh Jaisal, and Priyadoshini Panda. So it's recently published in Nature. So they make a summary perspective paper on neuromorphic computing. I found, I was going through a few of these review articles, and I found this one nicely covered what I wanted to discuss today, that mostly spiking neuromorphic system. And so I, I'll follow this article uh, mostly, and uh, it, this has a lot of great references to the, to the seminal papers in the field. So if you are interested, you can always go and read this paper and you know, check those references if you want to go deep into, let's say, algorithm, or device or circuit or you know, any of those statements. So let me start a little bit with the organizational principles of the brain. So here is a very rough schematic. So in this thing, there are like lots of neurons in a human brain and each neuron is connected to 10,000 other neurons through something we are calling synapses. Now there is actually a lot more going on in actual human brain, but for our purposes, let's just keep it simple and say that neuron is uh, like the main computational unit and synapse is the main learning. In actual brain, it's not as simple as that. Synapse do a lot of computation as well. Neuron also can learn and adapt with time. But that's kind of the idea that we have some neurons which has highly nonlinear behavior and the synapse can adapt with time, have some plasticity and learn based on experience. So that was the original idea behind neural network and how we can learn from them. Now, one interesting difference between the current revolution in artificial neural network and uh, the way brain works is that brain does not produce real valued output. So let's say you are using a sigmoid function or a ReLU function in the artificial neural network, then each neuron's output can be any value, let's say between zero and one or between minus one and plus one. But it's a continuous range, so it can be infinite possibilities. Uh, Human brain, surprisingly, though internal operation is very analog, its output, neurons outputs is very digital. So it's either zero or one. It's either a spike or not a spike. So if you are below a certain threshold, it does not spike, or otherwise it just spike. So it's one or zero in, in that sense, surprisingly. So that's very different compared to uh, current conventional artificial neural network. So let's give an example with, uh, so this is from this paper as well. So they are showing a nice example that you give a input to the deep neural network of modern day. So there are a lot of layers, hidden layers, and each of them has certain uh, functions. So initially, let's say we extract the low level features, then mid level features, then the high level features, and eventually you make the correction. Normal current days, state of the art, uh, state of the art 
uh, networks are huge. There are a lot of hidden layers, a lot of computation going on. They are very accurate. They're, they're also pretty fast nowadays, but the training cost is, if you think about dynamic computation, that is significant. Also the inference, if you actually want to deploy this thing, you have to actually have these weights and all of them are doing some computations. There is a significant cost, but yes, the performance is great. The main thing is that we have a good algorithm for learning. So the original back propagation algorithm from Rumel Hart and uh, Hinton, and uh, of course it has been updated and improved from since then. So that means that because our neurons is a abstraction from actual neurons. So the original people, they were inspired from neural network. That's why it's deep neural network, but their neurons is different. Why is it not spiking? Why it is uh, a sigmoid function or a value function? Because they wanted to, they wanted non-linearity, but not completely discontinuous, like zero to one, abrupt discontinuous non-linearity. This kind of hard non-linearity, if you have it, it's not differentiable. And the whole gradient descent depends on the fact that the cost function objective, you, have to be differentiated. So because we have a good algorithm, we can train this thing. Yes, it might take energy, it might take time of all that, but at least there is a solid algorithm that we know we can use and train this. Thing. That's a big challenge in spiking the world. Because the spiking world, uh, our mathematics is based on calculus and uh, linear algebra uh, that we are using here and especially calculus, which is very fundamental, the way we describe the world, it is it works very well with this kind of continuous function. So when we face this kind of abrupt discontinuity, our math, I mean, we struggle, like how to explain, uh, right? So the algorithm, we still don't have a uh, solid algorithm that we can use to train a spiking neural network, which is a huge challenge. So this is a, a picture of the, from the same paper, the silicon computing ecosystem. We have talked about this a little bit. So in the lower level, we have the MOS transistor, we build them, make a CPU engine, there is a memory hierarchy, and then you have maybe cloud-based servers of CPUs and GPUs, and you build on this thing. Now, what is the difference between, uh, what, what is the difference between uh, this thing and the thing? So, First of all is that segregation of computation and the memory, the von Neumann bottleneck. And in brain, the synapses and neuron, uh, you know, they are co-located computing instruments. So that's the big difference. We've already mentioned this. Another thing is that in brain, there is a three-dimensional connectivity. So there's a three-dimensional structure. Uh, in conventional silicon, connections are in two dimensions. So it's a plane, and then there are multiple planes. So in modern high processes, there might be 10 or 100 metal layers. But you know, each of them are two layer and then you interconnect them through higher. It's not possible, at least we still don't have the technology to create completely 3D connection, sparse arbitrary connection through like brain. And so there's something very surprising about brain. So when you do VLSI connections like this, what do you want is that, okay, if there is a particular computation block and there is another computational block, we want to keep them close to each other, right? And then you connect them. We don't intentionally put a two connected block far apart, but that's what is happening in real brain. Again, I want to emphasize this point, which is very surprising, that in real brain, you would expect that neurons in a certain area are connected together, and then neurons in another person are connected together, and there may be a link between them. That's not what is happening. The far apart neurons sometimes come back to the original neuron, and even if the distance increases, yes, connections decreases, but it does not decrease exponentially as we would expect. It, export, it uses a power law. So yet it decreases, but there is always a certain bit of recurrent connection that goes long distance away from each other, which is not good for our way of computation because fundamentally we don't use time in our computation. We make computation static. We know an input, it produces an output. Time, we explicitly program time if we want to use time. That's not how human brain works. In human brain, space and time are interrelated. How far apart that will determine how long it takes. And that is part of computation itself. The computation is not in the value of the spike because the spike is only one or zero, only two values. The computation is done, the interval between the spike, so the timing interval between them, which is fundamentally different from the way we perceive, or at least we have been doing computation. So, 
that creates a lot of architectural and algorithmic challenges there. So we have not yet figured out obviously how brain was very complicated system, but also it's a challenge for neuromorphic engineers. That, uh, how can we design an algorithm that will work with this kind of system? Uh, another problem is that uh, brain is inherently stochastic. Again, what we think in our world is a problem actually is a strength in brain. So uh, in digital computer, originally people use analog circuit or pencil stuff to compute things, but every, eventually everybody moved towards digital. Why? Analog is of course more computationally powerful. The problem is noise. Analog is not as immune to noise as digital systems. Uh, so, so eventually everybody, you know, most of the technology is now digital, computation is at least uh, digital. Uh, so we think of stochasticity, anything random as bad. We want to build absolutely deterministic system. You know, if anything is not absolutely deterministic, we consider that a bug in the It turns out, and we are not yet sure how it's actually happening, it turns out that stochasticity is actually a feature in human brain. At least it turns out that that's how that's why evolution has done it this way. That yes, brain computations are not exact. If you give the same input twice, you'll probably not get the same output twice as we want in our digital system. But apparently it's a good thing. So what some of the cognitive neuroscientists and computational modelists think is that probably this helps them to not be stuck to a local maximum. So that's a big problem in training algorithm and I'm you know, familiar with the more machine learning one. Uh, if you are stuck in a certain place, then suddenly there will be a random event that will happen and it will move you away. You are not supposed to, but it will just randomly move you away and it actually helps you to move away. Otherwise you'll be stuck and circling in the same place. So somehow, again, all the details are not clear yet, but there have been some very interesting ones. That stochasticity is leveraged in brain as if uh, it's a feature. So, so far we have been using silicon computing platform to do the deep learning thing. So uh, the huge energy and speed requirement produces a challenge. So we are trying to now do neuromorphic computing with all the advantages of the human brain. So let me just show a little bit of timeline. Again, all the details I'm not going to go towards this, but in 1940s to 1960s, people first idea of what is a spiking neuron. Hodgkin Huxley had a famous model of neuron, which is the very realistic model. And also during the same time, in the silicon world, we have been making big uh, breakthrough. The transistors are invented, von Neumanns are making the first computers. 1970s, 1980s was also a great time for artificial intelligence. It started greatly. So there was the original ideas, but then the something called the AI winter came and all that. But I'm not going there. But uh, the main idea is that around in the 1980s, they had the back propagation learning algorithm, which will become very powerful later. And also people came up with the idea of neuromorphic computing. This was actually led by uh, Carver Mead at Caltech. He first coined the term neuromorphic computing. He wanted to build analog computing blocks for neurons and synapse. In fact, he was one of the pioneers of VLSI as well. So he first started with VLSI, the pioneering work, wrote the first textbook, I think. And then in 1980s, he also realized this, that it has certain limitations. It's great for what it does. It has certain limitations. So he started exploring this brain-like computation paradigm, neuromorphic computing. He named this neuromorphic computing. Also, a little uh, unnoticed work in 1971, Leon Chua, a theoretician at University of California, Berkeley, he proposed that there is actually a fourth fundamental element from axiomatic principle of which should exist called memory state. And he developed this in 1976 with his student as well. So this idea was a theoretical work. Nobody has seen this yet. Um, People did not care that much about it, to be honest. So it was there in 1970s. Uh, it, it just happened in 1971. And then in 1990s, uh, you know, GPUs formally introduced, uh, address, address event uh, recording this thing uh, became for on-chip spike communication. Uh, some of the spiking models were introduced. Uh, Mess had a famous paper where he introduced three generation of neural networks. I'll talk about it. And then uh, in the 2000s, uh, we had the HP Labs, which came up with the first memory store after 30 years, seven years of prediction. Neuromorphic vision sensors became available, and a uh, lot of the big brain like chips was also invented. The new repeat, uh, and then uh, True North, and now IBM, Intel has 
uh, then doing the low EE and so forth. Anyway, so many there are many other present challenges in neuromorphic world. So I am just going to I'm put this in the slide. So if you want to explore any of them, you can do that. But let me go into the uh, current research and especially like the three generations of neural network to, to make a transition that what happened in this world. So in the 1940s and 50s, the first idea of neural network was done with perceptron. Uh, in that case, the neuron was a thresholding operation. So inputs are summed up through synapse or weights. And then you either do a hard one or zero. Right? So that was the perceptron. Then uh, people found out the problem with hard transition. You can do calculus, uh, gradient descent, and so forth. Anyway, so sigmoid function or rectified linear view. This is the driving engine between behind the current day revolution, artificial neural network or convolutional neural network. So these deep nets are all continuation of this second generation of neurons. And the third generation of neuron is this spiking neurons, which are more brain-like. So there are quite a few varieties. Uh, I will show one at least. So for example, in spiking neural network, this third generation computing, by the way, this is not my nomenclature. This is from a seminal paper by Mass. I'll put the link here as well. So he was saying that this third generation of spiking neural network. So let's look at this example. So inputs are not continuous time value. It's either one or zero. Information is actually encoded in the time interval between inputs. So let's say this is the input layer and the inputs are coming and thus neurons are producing some output, uh, the input neuron. They are going through a bunch of weights. So input one is going through weight one, W1. Input two is going to W2. You can think of this W1, W2, W3 as synaptic strength. You can learn this, you can modify this. And based on that, it determines how much it will contribute to the next neuron. So in the literature, they will call the first layer pre-neuron and the second layer post-neuron. And the connection is the synapse. So every synapse will have a pre-neuron and the post-neuron. Now in the neuron, the operation that is happening is first of all a summing operation. All the inputs are summed. And then a thresholding operation, you make a decision. So there is a threshold value. If you go behind this threshold, this post neuron produces an output spike and that may connect to the next layer of neuron, right? And this is a feed forward architecture. So inputs to outputs, left to right. But in actual neural network in human brain, there is a lot of recurrent connection. Again, most of the revolution and the learning method that was developed for artificial neural network, it was based on feed forward architecture. And then, of course, people understood that recurrent neural network is important. And but recurrent neural network is a more, much more difficult piece because it's a dynamical system. So, same problem with spiking neural network. People have been trying to do recurrent spiking neural network, which makes matters even worse. So, the training algorithms become more difficult. But let me show a little bit of how a neuron looks like. So, when a spike comes up, the membrane potential of the neuron goes up, and then there is no spike; it goes down, decays. And then again, a spike comes and it goes up, goes down, and so forth. Once there is enough number of spikes come in a quick interval, you can reach the threshold. And once you reach the threshold, voila, you have the green post spike. So that's kind of the idea. This is what is happening. After spike happens, neuron kind of goes through a sleep mode for a while. It's called the refractory period. So during this time, even if input signal comes, it does not integrate the input signal. It does not care. It's just in complete hibernation. After this <laughs> refractory period, it again starts integrating the input. So you can think of in human as well. So if you take if, so right now I'm talking for a long time. So probably initially you are kind of going a little bit listening into, into getting into the step. But after a while, you are now probably you know getting like how long will this continue? So this is your refractory period. So at this time you are not taking in any input. You are probably we're zooming out and then maybe after five minutes you feel like oh maybe i can listen again and then uh, you get interested again in so what spiking neural network people are trying to do is that they are trying to see that well we know from cognitive neuroscientists that human brains neurons have this functionality in artificial neural network we are not doing any of this we have a simple non-linearity continuous function do differentiation gradient descent learn this thing work great but maybe the reason evolution came up with this is maybe all these things are not just there for you know, random purpose. 
Maybe there is some computational purpose why they exist. So can we learn something from this and implement them in our spec engineering? So that's kind of the idea. Now I am grossly overestimated my time apparently. So I am already 50 minutes down the road. So uh, Dr. Mahbub, are you here? Yeah. So how long? Yeah. You have, I mean, 6.30 is our okay. uh, cut of time, yeah. Cut of time, and after that, is there a discussion? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you have time and if the audience will stay, I, I don't okay, know. Okay, I, I would like to have at least some, like, allow the audience to ask some questions. So, okay, sure. in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to wrap it up. So, basically, uh, what are the challenges and opportunities in this field? I'm going to mention them. So SNLs are behind the deep learning network, to be honest. Like most learning tests, spiky neural network is still not as accurate as current state of the data. Okay, so that's one problem. Another problem is the data available. Most of the data, the form they are in, they are not in spiking format. So we are still taking uh, static image, continuous time, uh, continuous data value, and we encode that as spike. So that's one, that's another big problem. Uh, another big problem is the learning algorithm, as I have been referring. So how can you come up with a learning algorithm for a spiking work, given the problems of uh, hard threshold, uh, non-differentiability, and also recurrent neural, uh, all that. So one way people have been trying is that people are doing conversion. So first they do a deep learning network, uh, train it, then they convert the deep neural network to a spiking neural network where the inputs are converted into spikes and outputs are converted into spikes. There are rescaling and normalizing methods that people have been developing. So far, this has given the best result. The problem is that, of course, this is not the real deal because this is not the real learning algorithm. We are kind of avoiding the problem. Uh, also, the reason we want to do spike in your network is to avoid that energy cost and high speed and good latency. Uh, unfortunately, this whole conversion mechanism solves the problem, but then the final network does not have those energy efficiency anymore. I mean, they're much worse compared to what is spiking neural network can do. So it's a way around the problem. I don't think it's actually solving the problem, but it's it, it's a it's a very interesting thing. People have been doing having get some good results. What would like to do the community? I think would that actually spike based learning algorithm, and then there can be supervised or there can be unsupervised. Uh, learning, as you know. So supervised learning, the problem is the gradient descent. So what people have done is that they have approximated the hard discontinuity with something approximating continuity so that it's good enough, and then you can do calculus and gradient descent. And there have been some promising results on that. Uh, there have been quite a few other works, but uh, I'm not going to that right now. For unsupervised learning, it has huge potential because in starting from 1940s and 50s, neuroscientists knew. So there is a rule called Hebbian's rule, uh, Hebb's rule, is uh, neurons that fire together, wire together. So in our previous figure, if you look at this uh, thing, that if the post neuron spikes after the pre neuron, then we say that the weight should increase. So we, we want some influence from input to pre-neuron to post-neuron, it looks like they should connect together. So neurons that fire together should wire together. So if the delta T, the time difference between post and pre-neuron is positive, we increase the weight. So that's the learning algorithm. How do you change that, update the weight? And if it is the reverse, then you decrease the weight. So it's shown here in the figure. So if the delta T is positive, you increase the weight. If your delta T is negative, you decrease the weight and it exponentially goes. And people have used this unsupervised learning rule. It's a local learning rule. Uh, so just, uh, you, know, you don't need the final full thing. And shown some good results for this data. It's a very promising field. Still, there is problem because local learning rule, how to extend this to a the full network, it's not clear yet. Active field of research. So learning algorithm development is a huge challenge in this field. Uh, for there are a few other things which are both challenges and also because of challenge, there are actually opportunities. So we can go beyond the static image classification. Uh, so right now, most of the work in the deep neural network world is static image classification or that kind of thing. And nowadays, natural language processing as well. So 
most SSM work has been benchmarked with static image classification. Can we do more than that? So there are now event-based camera where the image is not frame-based, it's more event-based, which is naturally suited to how human brain processes things. So people are doing actually very interesting research with event-based camera and neuromorphic architecture. They seem like a perfect match for me. So I am hoping that there will be interesting results. A lifelong learning, so human beings live over a long time. So that's a big challenge. Maybe neural network, spike neural network can help with that. Uh, we also forget things, and there has been some interesting work in neural network, it's SNL field, that how forgetting is actually helpful, and how can you avoid what is called catastrophic forgetting in the DNL world. Uh, how can we learn with fewer data? So this has been a big problem. It's, in fact, the pioneers like interns and the young generation, they all talk about this, that when a child learns, uh, they learn, so our chair GPT is learning language and showing some apparently good results, but uh, it is training on a huge amount of data set, huge computation power. It's unlikely that a human child learns language with so much label data, it definitely doesn't. So obviously something else is going on, learning with fewer data. Uh, can, we, can we do uh, something better? Uh, neuroscience connection, this is purely science oriented people. That can we learn more about actually the human brain? Uh, of course, that's fascinating in its own right, even if it does not have any computational development. Hardware development with device circuit co design. So, uh, the transistor, the building block, that's the revolution. Can we come up with new circuits and devices that are like, perfectly suitable for this neural network or uh, implementation? So, memory stores, phase change memory, magnetic RAM. People have been proposing these emerging devices that are perfectly suited for this new paradigm. Uh, big brain chips like Intel, Lohi, IBM, Trunot, and all these things people are developing. So billions of neurons, millions of neurons, billions of synapses. Uh, asynchronous address event representation or AER. So our conventional computers are digital. Uh, they have a synchronous. Synchronous means that it has a global clock and every clock second it does that. But human brain does not work like that. There is not a global clock in our brain. So it is local calculation and there is asynchronous communication. So whenever an event happens, it there is something. So in neuromorphic computing, what we ideally want to do is not have a global clock, instead event-based communication. There will be sparse connection and much less energy. So when there is no event, there is no energy. In conventional digital computing, you can't do that. Every time there is a clock, whatever you, whatever you do something or not do something, and because transistors have become leaky, you're always consuming some power, even if you are not doing anything. But asynchronous design is much more difficult. There is the challenge and as well as the opportunity. A network on chip, how can you connect them? People have been proposing interesting way to do the communication. In fact, uh, there has been some exciting work using optoelectronic electronic So the computational done on silicon or maybe superconducting devices or the so NIST is doing this actually. So uh, some highly computationally efficient platform, but then the communication, data communication will not be through wires but instead through optoelectronics, some photonics thing. So um, amazing things can happen in that field, I, I, I personally think. Uh, the main goal is to go beyond one human computing. So we'll do processing and compute in the same place. So no bottleneck of that memory bottleneck. Uh, Non-volatile technology have been revolutionary. So I talked about Memristor. So 2008, first uh, experimental demonstration of Memristor. And since then in the last 10 years, 10, 15 years, there have been uh, plenty of groups who have proposed new devices, still not matured, but hopefully we'll go there pretty soon. Uh, and then there is the mixed signal analog computing. How can you build good neurons and uh, synapses that can do this thing? A memory strip dot product engine. So the fundamental linear algebra operation in this thing is matrix vector multiplication. So you can build cross bars with memory stars and do this using Felix. So what actually happens is that Ohm's law does the multiplication and Kashov's current law does the addition. So you don't have to explicitly do multiplication or addition like you have to do in a digital computer. The inherent device physics of this device do this computation for you. The problem is they are analog, so not as accurate or robust as the digital design. So then you need to do algorithm hardware co-design so that even when there is variation in your analog circuit, your algorithm will work, which is a huge challenge. People are working on it. Another thing is stochasticity. Uh, probabilistic, uh, so there has been Boltzmann uh, machine, um, Hopfield network, 
people have been trying to see the probabilistic, uh, how can you include probability and stochasticity into algorithm? Some interesting results there as well. And of course, hybrid design. So you have silicon and other new heterogeneous devices and combine them um, together in a system. So that's kind of this thing. After that, I was supposed to go into my own research. Unfortunately, I will not have time to do that. But uh, uh, so I have been working on a niche field in neuromorphic computing, uh, evolutionary optimization for a spiking neural network. I worked on that for two years in as a postdoc. And then for the last three year and a half years, I've been we've been developing with my collaborator, Dr. Joseph Nazim in Penn State University. We have been developing a reserver computing framework for a specific volatile membristic device, which is very brain-like in its behavior because it is biomolecular, not solid state. Anyway, I think it is very interesting. Many people might disagree, but uh, I, I will have the slides so you can look at the research. I hope you will like it. But with that, uh, I will stop for now. If you thanks for listening, and if you have any questions, I will. Thanks a lot, Dr. Hassan. Uh, so, yeah, if, if there is any question from the audience, feel free to uh, unmute and ask. Uh, yeah, I have a quick question about the SNN. Yeah. So, I see there you have the, the weights that are actually being uh, multiplied by the input spike train. And you right. sum the results of those weights. So they, there must be a backward propagation process. For a supervised learning um, process, that's pretty straightforward. You, you figure out how well your prediction did based on your threshold to the expected output, and you feed it back from the error result. But how would you do that with a unsupervised uh, model where you don't really have a target, you're just doing sort of clustering? How would you update the weights in that realm? Yeah, so that's what I was saying that what people do, there are a few answers, uh, some unsupervised algorithm that people have been uh, exploring, mainly inspired from neuroscience. So what neuroscientists have found out is that uh, in this figure, I think you can see my cursor, right? So uh, there is this post neuron and the pre neuron. If the post neuron fires after the pre neuron, what the assumption is that, that this post neuron has fired because of the contribution from the P neurons. So probably the information that is coming from this P neuron to this post neuron is useful. So let's make this stronger, make this weight stronger. Conversely, I know, I know that you might have questions about it. I also have questions, about it. but I'm just saying that what the algorithm is. And when the post neuron fires before the pre neuron, it's the reverse. So you reduce the weight. So that's how you do the weight update. You are not looking at the final result. There is no label data. It's a local thing. So in one layer, you are looking at the output and the input. And based on that, you are making this decision. Apparently from neuroscience, what we have seen is that this famous rule from HEPs called the HEPs rule, ABN rule, is that neurons that were fired together should wire together. So if this post neuron fires after this P neuron, that we will assume that their connection, this particular weight, W3 in this case, should be potentiated in their language. So that means the weight should go up. Or if in the converse case, it should be depressed or it should go down. Apparently that's what happened. Now, of course, that's on its own is not enough. So there is also inhibitory connection. So, this, so there are excitatory, I was not able to go over all the details. So there are excitatory, excitatory connections and inhibitory connections so that things don't, don't go exponentially up or exponentially down and you can kind of keep it stable. But this is one unsupervised algorithm. And there has been a work, I remember Deal and others, 2017 and 18, where they have shown that just by doing STDP with a few tweaks unsupervised, they were able to classify MNIST data set. And it's not the huge data set in current day maybe, but they were able to get almost a state of the art accuracy using uh, working on developing on this stdp learning method so stdp is one very famous learning method some other unsupervised learning method actually i have been working with is called short term plasticity so in conventional neural network you have a weight right you learn this weight throughout the training maybe gradient descent once you have learned the weight you put the weight 
So let's say I have learned what is the base value of W1 for this problem, W2. Level. You just program these devices and then input comes, you get the correct output. Hopefully. In real synapse, that's not how it happens. Yes, there is a long-term memory. It learns and it makes the connection, but there is also a short-term memory. So synaptic weight is not fixed. Synapse itself learns two times. So if the input sequence comes fast and fast, then synapse weight keeps increasing, increasing, increasing. But then if it input stream becomes slower, the synapse system goes down. I'll give a simple example. So for example, when I am listening to someone, initially I am interested, my attention is there. The, this, if you think of my, in, my uh, attention as this synaptic weight, some connection in my brain, it is getting stronger and stronger, but so it's, but after a while it starts become saturated. So maybe I have a time level of time scale of 10, 15 minutes. After 10, 15 minutes, I cannot follow it. It's getting saturated. And then actually it becomes depressed. So I, in fact, now I'm just passing this through from one year to another, right? Very crude example, but I'm just saying that in actual human synapse is not fixed as we are doing in an artificial neural network, which is of course, they know this, and this is an abstraction useful for computation, but I'm just saying that actual synapse are not fixed in time. It changes on input. That's actually part of my research. So the particular device that I work with has a short-term plasticity, which only works on the input. It doesn't even look at the immediate output, forget the final output, like no supervision at all. Like this completely unsupervised thing apparently is helpful for online learning. So it helps human being to process things, all animals. So our synapses in uh, organi organisms, the synapses and neurons in organisms have quite a few of these unsupervised learning mechanism that apparently help them to adapt to new circumstances. So the actual algorithm of why this is computationally helpful is not clear here. So, and there is a chicken and egg problem. So computationally simulating human brain on conventional von Neumann computer is very difficult. You have to build a good uh, neuromorphic computer, spiking neural computer, to simulate human brain to understand human brain. But to, uh, to build a good spiking neural network based computing system, you need to understand how human brain does this. So yeah, there is a chicken and egg problem between cognitive neuroscientists and uh, neuromorphic engineers who are trying to help each other out in two parts of this question. Nice. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> anyone else uh, have any question? Uh, yes. So thank you for the great talk. Uh, so your question is, uh, what is what's the difference between this design and the tensor processing unit? For example, Google Tensor. So it's also an in-chip processor. So it's a neural net network processor. So what's this idea? What's the main difference between these two? Yeah, the main difference, I mean, there are quite a few differences, but the main difference is that uh, the data format. So in this case, data can be either a spike or dot is, right? But in TensorFlow, Tensor is, or whatever CPU you're using, in that case, data is represented as a continuous number. It can take a range of number between zero to one, right? It's a continuous value. Uh, that's not what a spike is. A spike is either a spike or not a spike. But if I make the input to one and then generate uh, neural layers, will it be converged convert to the converge to the same solution? Yeah, so that's one method that I mentioned that one of the way people are doing this is they're doing conversion business. So first they've solved the problem with deep neural network, what you're saying, with, uh, and then they convert this to an equivalent spiking neural network. Now it's not as simple as it's uh, sounds because um, there are also fundamental differences between the neurons and synapses between artificial neural network and spiking neural network. Uh, synapses, as I'm saying, synapses has much more functionality in real synapses, but most importantly, the neuron part. Uh, this is the neuron equation. In uh, This is the simplest neuron equation, uh, leaky integrated file. Uh, actual neurons, if you look at Hodgkin Huxley neuron, these are three, uh, three-dimensional ordinary differential equation with three state variables or even more than that. So pretty complex dynamics with a very discontinuous thresholding, which is the problem for the calculus and radial design. So 
So converting from this neural network architecture, though superficially it looks very similar because of this two main difference that the neuron block is very different. Um, synaptic block also can be slightly different. And because of the spike nature compared to the real valued nature, makes the conversion also very challenging. But this has been, I think, the most advanced. So people have made the best result so far with this conversion. Model. However, it does not take the best advantage of spiking neural network. So the final network that you get, it actually produces good accuracy. But the main promise of spiking neural network is that low energy, efficient computation. These circuits are actually becomes huge and consume a lot of power. So I think personally, I mean, people might disagree. I personally think that or the, our goal should be to come up with an algorithm that is for spike based. So this is a difficult problem, but a kind of algorithm which is for spike based and it can be supervised, it can be unsupervised. Both are separate problems, you know, to work on that, but something that is natively designed for a spike based neural network. That way, we will get the best possible uh, advantage out of this system. Um, so then in the chipset, you will have CPU, you will have the tensor unit, and you will have a graphic uh, GPU. So this, this new topic will, will be like a potential replacement of the tensor unit, tensor processing unit, is it? So it's yeah. not a replacement of a CPU. No. Okay. No, so personally speaking, I don't think that it will replace all computation. I still think that what we have done in digital computer, it is actually very good for certain things. So if you are doing math operations, let's say, right? Uh, I think you actually want deterministic, always same input, same output, that kind of work, right? You don't want to that. But there are lots of real life activities. So if you want to build a general intelligence, right? So something which is artificial general intelligence, that is, which is kind of the holy grail of uh, artificial. So someone who can not just do one thing very well, it's very, with conventional digital computer, you can make something that works for that problem very well, right? In fact, the artificial neural network or deep neural network has the same thing. One thing you can make it very well. It's very difficult to make it amenable and flexible around, so that it can adapt and learn to move. So I think that sort of application, like movement, real life movement, which we think for take for granted, it is iconic. I, I think it is ironic and instructive that in if you look into the science fiction books and stuff from 1930s and 40s, people predicted that we'll have a robot in 1950s and 60s, which will talk like human beings, which will do it like nobody predicted internet. Nobody predicted going to moon and stuff like that. Going to moon seemed like a very difficult problem. And Moving like human beings, talking like human beings seems like the easiest problem because we do this without any effort. I think this is very misleading. Actually speaking, language, perception, these are very difficult things. We do it effortlessly because evolution has prepared us you know, millions of years to do this effortlessly. When you actually want to be, when you actually went there and tried to build a machine that can do the same things, an intelligent robot, we found out that it's such a difficult problem to build this thing. So sometimes a problem that can seem easy is actually very difficult. And sometimes, so that kind of thing happens. So nowadays in the palm of my hand, I can have a smartphone, which is more computational power than the computer that was used to send a rocket to the moon, you know? And still now we don't have a robot that can talk like human beings and move like human beings that are as flexible and as general intelligence, which seemed like people would have, so if you read, like the movie, famous movie, 1960 or the uh, 2001, a Space Odyssey. So it was written around 1940s and 50s. It was long future, 2001, a Space Odyssey. So by 2000, obviously we'll have this. We are now in 2023. We are nowhere near that CDC in that book. So, you know, I think mimicking brain and learning how they do this is much more difficult than we probably give up. I think we are much more intelligent than intelligent that we give ourselves credit. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I, I think I've learned a lot <laughs> today. Yeah. Thanks everyone for being such a nice audience. Okay, thank you.